Hello, my name's Julie Doughty and I'm from Cardiff University School of Law and Politics and I'm going to be talking today about adoption of children from care and human rights. I'm not using any images with this um, broadcast so um, please feel free to turn your screen off and have a little bit of a rest from looking at screens and uh, you can just listen to um, the audio version like a podcast. Okay, so why do I want to talk about adoption of children from care? Imagine when you were growing up as a teenager, finding out that the state had made an order removing you from your birth family permanently and transferring you legally into a brand new family that had no connection with yours beforehand. Imagine as a teenager all those questions about questioning your place in the world, your identity, who am I, where do I fit in, why don't I get on with my parents, etc, etc. Imagine all of that and then a whole extra layer of where do I come from, why did my family give me up, why did the authorities steal me from my parents, where are they, are they okay, what is there about my birth family that's within me that I'll never be able to find out about, etc, etc. Um, and also, um, for quite a number of children who were adopted, they will have already had some adverse experiences beforehand um, that they might need some extra help with. Now, however much you love your adoptive parents and however brilliant they are, and most adopters are absolutely brilliant, those are the sorts of questions that are going to be um, asked by young people as they grow up or even into adulthood. Did the state do enough for me and my birth family before they took me away and um, transferred me to a different family? OK, um, so uh, this is a really controversial, a relatively controversial topic in the law of England and Wales because there is a perception that in England and Wales, especially in England, um, we use the um, mechanism of adoption against birth parents' consent too often and more often than in other countries. Um, and you can read <coughs> useful reports by Claire Fenton Glynn about um, comparing our use of adoption in England, particularly with other European countries. Um, I'm not going to be saying a lot about birth fathers in this talk because there is already um, a talk on the Cambridge University uh, web page here uh, by Brian Sloan uh, focusing on birth fathers so I'm not specifically going to talk about them today um, and I'm basing most of what I'm going to say on an article that was published in the um, International Journal of Law Policy and the Family in um, 2019. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the law and also um, based on some of the data that we gathered in um, a study in Wales called the Wales Adoption Study. Um, so this Wales Adoption Study is led by a colleague of mine in the School of Psychology in Cardiff University, Professor Catherine Shelton. And I hope that also on the Cambridge University webpage, um, you'll be able to access a list of the publications that have come out of that study. So we've got very many publications, articles and papers about all sorts of aspects um, of the Wales Adoption Study. Um, different themes and issues and uh, different aspects of theory and practice. Um, so uh, that um, study, the Wales Adoption Study, was funded by the uh, Welsh Government and the first stage of that study was about us reading the case records of 374 children. <clears throat> All of the children that were um, from Wales were placed with adoptive families in the year 2014 to 2015. And the overall purpose of the study was <clears throat> to look at um, the characteristics and experiences of those children what their adoptive uh, families' support needs were in the stages of early placement and what factors help those children to flourish in the early stages of placement. Um, 
And just to mention some of the characteristics of the children involved, um, that uh, a, a quarter of those children uh, had uh, mothers who were themselves brought up in the care system. So that's an immediate indicator or suggestion, isn't it, of the state having let down um, those parents and those children. And about half of the children in the sample had suffered a higher level of what's known as adverse childhood experiences um, compared to the general population in Wales, which is at about only 14% compared to nearly half. Um, so other aspects, it was a mixed method study involving um, social sciences, uh, psychology and law. And uh, one of the aspects we looked at in the legal side was the legal process that the adoptive applicants had to go through um, and how uh, that, that uh, experience may have affected their relationships with um, their children. Um, as well as the case file study, um, we sent out questionnaires to survey adoptive families in the early stages um, and we originally had 96 responses to that survey. We've had other waves of surveys since then, always slightly smaller numbers for obvious reasons that, uh, you know, that always happens with this sort of empirical research, that the numbers decrease over time. Um, we also conducted uh, in-depth interviews with 40 adoptive parents. Um, and we looked at in the case uh, the case files also the contact plans that were in the case records, um, the post-adoption contact plans for those children. And what we found was that um, almost entirely the only contact plan that was made for those children with their birth parents was something that's known as letterbox contact, um, which is where there's an exchange of letters between the adopters and the birth parents. Although um, looking particularly at siblings, a third of the um, children we looked at were placed in sibling groups. So they were actually placed together with their own brothers and sisters. Um, and those of those who were placed separately and had siblings elsewhere, there were contact plans for 70 percent of those children. But of those, only about 20 percent were there any plans for face to face contact. So the whole issue of keeping in touch with your brothers and sisters over the years is another really important one. OK, so what is the law about adoption in England and Wales? It's governed by the Adoption and Children Act 2002 that came into force fully in 2005. We do have some divergence in law and policy in Wales now, um, but most of our law is still based on the 2002 Act. Um, now, to comply with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, that's the right to respect for private and family life, um, the court's power to make an adoption order without a parent's consent must be exercised only when necessary. And under the Adoption and Children Act uh, 2002, a birth parent's consent can only be dispensed with when the welfare of the child requires it. So that is to comply with the um, necessity point in uh, Euro the European Convention. Um, in a case, uh, a judgment delivered in 2012, YC against the UK, <clears throat> the European Court of Rights held that family ties can only be severed in very exceptional circumstances, permanently severed. Everything must be done to preserve and rebuild family relationships before getting to that stage. It is not enough to show that a child could be placed in a more beneficial environment um, than the one they're already in. But if the maintenance of those family ties would harm a child's health and development, the birth parents cannot insist that they are retained. In England and Wales, however, uh, for a child to be placed for adoption, they would have had to go through care proceedings um, during which the local authority would have established to the court that the child was at the risk of significant harm if um, their parent, if they uh, remained at home with their parents. Also, um, another European Convention uh, case, European Court of Human Rights case known as Kutzner, K-U-T-Z-N-E-R against Germany, um, held that the state needs to show it's offered support services to a family before being justified in removing children, in that case because of the parent's uh, poverty. Okay, now both parents' rights under Article 8 of the European Convention um, 
there's um, a whole load of literature there about uh, the requirement uh, to uh, look at the child's welfare and um, in exceptional circumstances to override the lack of parents' consent to the adoption. Um, what's known in some quarters as forced adoption. But it's important to remember um, that adoption in England and Wales does go through due legal process. OK, what about um, any ongoing Article 8 rights for the birth parents and the children? So traditionally, adoption was closed adoption in the sense that the, there was this completely artificial transfer of the child from one family to another. Um, and until relatively recently, even keeping the whole situation secret as though it was some sort of shameful secret to keep from the child. Um, that's definitely changed over recent years and children, uh, parents, are adopted parents are encouraged to bring up their child knowing that they are adopted and they go through very rigorous and um, it appears effective training before they become adopters to understand why that's important for the children and the birth family in general. Um, but also adoption is becoming more open in the sense that uh, there is this letterbox contact uh, although limited as it is, and um, encouraging encouragement of some face-to-face -face contact. Now, for practical reasons, that isn't happening as quickly as we might like. Um, and what we found in the Wells Adoption Study was that there appeared to be a blanket policy of this letterbox contact of exchange of letters, perhaps twice a year. Um, a recent, more recent case, uh, judgment delivered in 2015 called Re A, a High Court judgment, uh, Mr Justice Peter Jackson, as he then was, held that following the adoption order, um, the mother in that case, who was um, involved in letterbox contact, the birth mother I mean, um, she was involved in letterbox contact, but she was applying to the court under Article 8 um, for direct contact uh, with her child. And uh, Mr Justice Peter Jackson said that once the adoption order had been made, that the mother and child, the birth mother and child's Article 8 rights were extinguished and therefore there was no ongoing um, claim possible under Article 8 to enforce face-to-face um, -face contact between the mother and um, the child. OK, what about looking at children's rights and consent? Well, when... Um, an adoption order is being considered, the adoption agencies and the court must have regard to the uh, child's well, uh, must make the, sorry, must um, ensure that the child's welfare remains paramount and must have regard to a welfare checklist very similar to the welfare checklist, although with some slight variations very similar to that in the Children Act 1989. Um, and one of the items in the welfare checklist is that the court must have regard to the wishes and feelings of the child in accordance with their age and level of understanding. Um, however, most children are adopted before the age of four, so their um, age in those circumstances uh, means that there's some obvious limitations on conveying their wishes and feelings um, about being adopted. With regard to contact, the welfare checklist also includes a duty on courts and adoption agencies to make decisions about the child's welfare throughout their life and to include the effect on, on them of becoming an adopted person. So this would suggest that local authorities, adoption agencies and courts need to consider long term plans for what contact arrangements are going to be in place to meet the child's identity needs um, throughout their childhood and then uh, to ensure their kind of uh, healthy development into adulthood. <clears throat> um, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the child's rights continue after adoption, um, although their Article 8 rights have um, fallen away, according to um, Mr Justice Peter Jackson. Um, so that's the current um, <clears throat> understanding of, of the law there. So under the UNCRC, children's rights include rights to know and be brought up by their parents, rights to know their own identity, and rights to be brought up within their own culture. So looking at it through the children's rights lens, looking at uh, incorporating the UNCRC so far as we can within our own jurisdictions, um, <coughs> it's important to think about a child's right to ongoing contact with um, the birth family, 
their siblings, their former carers. They could um, have formed a very strong attachment to former foster carers and that's something that needs to be handled carefully when they move on to an adoptive placement. And all of this um, is really about helping the child form their identity within a stable and secure environment. And that may um, require a, um, adoptive families to be able to access therapeutic and other support services. Okay, in our study in Wales, um, we noted some of the following points. I'm just pulling out some highlights here. There were shortcomings in the systems that were designed to give the child and their adopters life story work um, in order to uh, enable the adoptive parents and the children to share information about the child's history before they went to the adoptive placement um, as the child grew up and in later life. Um, adopters tended to be sympathetic to birth parents rather than fearful or condemnatory of birth parents. However, letterbox contact wasn't easy to manage even when adopters saw it as important or as an obligation. Adopters especially in general wanted to maintain and promote links between children and their siblings and extended family although they received little ongoing support to do that. And although we're studying the Wales Adoption Study the early stages of placement adopters appreciated that children's um, needs to understand their identity would probably develop and change in the future. But resources are very concentrated on a transition period around the court order being made and ongoing support is very hard to find and to access. Okay, well I hope um, that short uh, little snapshot and some snippets from our Wales Adoption Study um, have uh, been helpful and if you're interested in the study or interested um, more widely in children's rights and adoption then please do have a look at the reference list that accompanies this short talk. Thank you.